Hi, my name is Mike Aben, and welcome to episode 7 of my KSP campaign. At the conclusion of the last episode, uh, I ended up designing a rocket that I hope will finally get me into orbit and also finish off some testing contracts, and we'll find out later if that turns out to be successful. But we do have a couple of other things to get through first. And here we are back with the Otter 1, uh, doing one of these aerial survey missions were to fly to site T2V and do a crew report at an altitude of underneath 17,600 meters, which the site is just offshore from the KSC, uh, so this won't take us very long. And again, to get the waypoint onto your nav ball, all you have to do is go over to map view, select the waypoint, and activate the navigation. So, once we... Uh, pick up that crew report and finish off this very short contract. I thought, you know what, we're not that far from the KSC, so why don't we pick up a little bit of science by making a quick trip down to the island airport. For those that don't know, the island airport is on one of the islands in a small chain of islands just to the east of the KSC. It's one of the east, easier of the Easter eggs to find, one of the easier ones to find and there's quite a lot of Easter eggs hidden about this game, but this one isn't too far away, and everybody at one point should make their way over here. has a little runway, making it pretty easy to land. There's uh, an old tower and a hangar and stuff that you can get out and explore if you like. I'm not going to get out and explore, because remember, this plane does not have a ladder, so if I get out of the plane and get my feet on the ground, or more properly, if Jebediah gets his feet on the ground, he won't be able to leave again. So uh, what we're just going to do is we're just going to, uh, f ooh, Tundra, well that's weird. There's lots of little places where you can find these little slivers of Tundra. I'm going to ignore it. Yes, I'm going to wait until I'm actually at the Tundra to collect some Tundra science. And instead what I'm shooting for is just some shore science. So we'll, we'll collect some shore science here. And then it's just a quick little flight back to the KSC to, uh, to recover the vessel. You always want to recover the vessels when you can by getting back onto the runway. That way uh, you get all 100% of your part value back and the only thing you've spent is what you spent on, on fuel. And here we are several days later uh, with a little science buggy. Um, I thought, you know what, I might as well build this little science buggy. I didn't have any more of those um, orbital survey, or not orbital, but aerial survey missions. So I'm out here with uh, with Bob, and we're going to drive around the KSC with this little little jet car, and we're going to collect ourselves a little science. I thought I might as well get some activity out of the hangar bay, and wait a minute, who the hell are you? You're not Bob, you're not my Bob anyway. I've been told my Bob has a distinct resemblance to Morgan Freeman, and you certainly are no Morgan Freeman. You're much more of a Woody Harrelson to me. Oh, okay. Obviously the textures got a little reshuffled or something like that, so I'm going to have to go in there and get my Bob back. Anyway, Bob is collecting data from here, but the great thing is, is that he's going to store it back into the command console. But once he's done with this, scientists have the ability to restore, or rest restore, not I'm in trouble with that, restore the experiments, in other words, make them available so that they can be done once again. So he's going to get back into the command capsule, back into the cockpit, we're going to fire up this little engine, keep ourselves under some control, because this is not a plane, <laughs> so we don't want to go too fast, and we're just going to drive to different biomes in the Kerbal Space Center, and there are quite a few to visit. There is the KSC in general. Then there's the runway, which we just got here. There is the administrative building, the astronaut complex, the research and development complex, the tracking station, the vehicle assembly building, the crawlway, the launch pad, the, and the space plane hangar. And all of these you can collect all of your various surface sciences at. So it is definitely worth your while to run around and do these little missions. Now it's pretty difficult to botch this mission, though I did manage to get my right rear wheel stuck 
in this little trench here on the crawlway that I didn't even know was really there. So it took a little bit of finagling to get the vehicle to turn around and pivot on that wheel and get it pointing in, in the right direction so that I could get out of here. But I ended up getting out of here and visiting the rest of the biomes and around the KSC and that ended up netting me that little mission 125 science giving me a total of 156 science this should allow me to do some damage on the tech tree and damage i did finishing off the entire tier four uh first unlocking basic science which gets me the stuputnik probe some batteries antennas also the thermometer and the scansat altimeter this should get me going with some uh unmanned probes pretty soon uh, I also went with advanced rocketry, which is going to get me some bigger and better engines and some bigger and better fuel tanks. And right alongside that, general constructor, which construction, which gives me adapters, struts, and launch clamps. All of this should allow me to build some much better rockets. And in addition to that, it also a lot unlocked three additional uh, upgrade points for Kerbal construction time two of which I put to the second vehicle bay in the vehicle assembly building, and one more to research and development to help me research my tech more quickly. And that brings us to the Kirkuri 2, and those that caught last episode might recall me testing this rocket in simulation mode at the end of the episode. This was a tall, dangly, wobbly rocket that I had to fly without the SAS on, and I used it to demonstrate a proper gravity turn where you just nudge it very slightly towards the east shortly after takeoff and then it followed the prograde vector with very little input on my part all the way up into orbit following a very nice ascent trajectory. Well, now you're going to get a taste of what I'm like when I'm not in sim mode. And we're flying up. And a little then that was way too big a nudge to the east and now I got the I'm trying to correct for it oh my lord that was a panic that was a that was pure and simple that was a choke that's all that was and now it's falling over too quickly and I know it's falling over too quickly and I'm trying to pull it back pull it back but this particular rocket will have none of that and you can see here I'm only at about what 23 kilometers and I am way too low to be flying at this shallow a pitch and I'm trying to pitch up uh, and I'm wasting fuel so badly I just ran out of fuel I gotta ditch that bottom stage and now it's all up to ooh, now whoa 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 put the SAS back on there we go <laughs> and now it's all up to this little orbiter which it's it's under so it's burning through fuel quickly uh, well anyway Apoapsis is now up to 80 kilometers I got 625 meters per second left. <sighs> Shouldn't have pushed that apoapsis up so high either. I was just, uh, uh, and it's so frustrating because I, I got this thing, I got up to, up into space in a suborbital trajectory and still had fuel left in that first stage before. And here we are up at apoapsis desperately trying to push my periapsis up above 70 kilometers but quickly running out of fuel and that's it periapsis 5.6 kilometers that is by no stretch in orbit and although valentina is having a good time this is pretty frustrating so this is my third attempt to get into orbit and not quite make it I do manage to grab up a little bit of uh, EVA in space over Kerbin Shore, so, and I did get one contract for uh, testing the thud engine on the surface, whatever small consolation that is, but other than that, there's nothing left to it, um, it's time, you know, uh, Valentina's on her way back down, the capsule recovered without any issues, but... I don't know. I gotta get into an orbit someday. Not surprisingly, I was a little frustrated after that, and that play session came to an end. I wasn't in the mood to keep playing. And when I came back, well, once again, most of my contracts had disappeared. Now, I think I'm zeroing in on uh, what the cause of this is. I think it has something to do with um, 
the contract configurator mod and uh, I have since they have since put out an update to try and deal with a bit of a bug fix fit uh, to deal with this bug or at least a similar bug it sounds like it's the same bug anyway um, and hopefully that's going to be addressed soon into the next episode but one of the things some people might be noticing is as I repopulate my uh, contracts I I keep getting more advances when I lose contracts, they don't count as failure, so my money doesn't come down. They just disappear. But every time I repopulate, uh, I get I get more money. And, and, and I'm starting to realize that this isn't really fair. So you'll see in the next episode, I don't spend any money here other than to build a craft. Um, and in the next episode, you'll see me address this and bring the my cash flow down to where I think it would have been if I didn't have to do all of these re-respawning of all of these contracts all the time oh, yeah. but for now i've got bigger fish to fry i got to get this monkey off my back and get something into a stable orbit i had just unlocked the two-man radish capsule from uh homegrown rockets and so i my first thought was why don't i see if i can put this thing to 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 use maybe make an actual science vessel and take both bob and uh a pilot up and do some actual good science collecting. Um, I ended up abandoning that idea because of the extra weight. I don't have any more, uh, I don't have any part testing contracts right now. I lost all those. Um, all I have as far as contracts that have to do with going into orbit is the get into orbit contract and to beat that 2,500 meter per second um, speed record. So I thought, you know what, I'm gonna build a vessel that's just gonna be about those two things. So I abandoned the radish capsule i'll get back to that at some other time went down to just a single one-man capsule just going to send up a pilot i want to build this thing as light as i can and i want to get it to be fast now probably the first thing you're noticing about this rocket over my previous ones is the prominent presence of the back the dacc solid rocket boosters there's four of them on this thing right now um why I did not go to these earlier, I really can't say. I mean, they're the same part count as those RT-10s that I've been using lately. Um, they're still just one part. Um, they're much more massive, but they contain a lot more Delta V. But mass is not an issue for my rockets because uh, because I've upgraded the launch pad. So why I... I don't know. I can't explain it. But I want to build something that's going to be a lot more dependable. I want to take a quick look at my uh, life support here. This is from TAC Life Support, and what I'm looking at is the electricity. And it's telling me that I have two, about two hours and 20 minutes of electricity on this thing. I have no batteries other than the batteries that are in the command capsule, and I have no uh, solar generation unlocked yet either. If I run out of electricity, I do lose attitude control. But more importantly, with TAC Life uh, Support, if you are without electricity for a period of time i can't remember exactly what it is but i'd rather not push it uh your little kerbals will freeze to death i certainly don't want that happening so that two hours that's probably with uh the sas turned off and this is a concern because if i bring my velocity up to about 2500 meters per second i'm probably going to be pushing my apoapsis up to about 600 kilometers by my calculation and that'll push my orbital period the time it takes to go around and do a complete orbit to about 50 minutes i want to make sure i do not run out of electricity over that time and now i'm going to show you what i think is my favorite uh new part that i just unlocked this is the scriptable control system from kos what it is is a little computer core that I can put into my rocket and allow me to upload uh, programs to it. Programs that are written in a language called KerboScript, programs that we have to write ourselves, but nonetheless, I do have that I, I very, what I think is a nice little launch script that I will be showing you very, very shortly that I actually wrote a couple of campaigns ago. And this is going to be uh, my insurance against my all thumbs fingers that I seem to be of having of lately and hopefully it's passing control over to a, uh, a script a computer program might be the way to go to get me to get my uh, ascents the way I want them to be 
Okay, so let's talk a bit about the mission plan. So to get to orbital velocity, remember it takes is about 2.2 and a half kilometers per second, somewhere in that ballpark. So to get up to 2,500 meters per second, that's going to allow, I'm going to have to burn about an extra, I budgeted about 300 meters per second to get up to an orbital velocity of about 2,500 meters per second. However, as I mentioned, that's going to push up my uh, period up to close to an hour, which is going to give me some electricity concerns. So what I also thought is I wanted to give myself the option of simply turning the vessel around and burning that 300 meters per second uh, the other way. And then that way, I won't have to do the whole period. I might be able, I should be able to get Jeb down if electricity is looking to be a little bit sketchy. And that's why this vessel has a total of 4,267 meters per second. That is probably, that's over, probably around 600 meters per second more than what I need just to get into an orbit. All right, so let's test this thing out. So we're going to open up the KOS, uh, the, 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 the screen here, the terminal, that's the word I was looking for, and we're going to copy my launch program uh, into the vessel, and then we're going to launch it, and I have to put in the heading that I want, so I want it to go on a heading of 90 degrees, which is pure east, and away we go. Uh, yeah, and the, this launch script, um, I've written in such a way that I can actually enter in headings so that I can launch into different inclinations should I be desire should I desire to. Um, and all this script does is point the vessel in the right direction. It's just about controlling its attitude. It doesn't do anything with thrust or anything like that. Remember what I always like to do is I like to tweak the thrust of my engines so that uh, I don't have to adjust thrust on my way up. It also doesn't do any staging, but I have a trick, I'm, so I'm going to have to stage it manually, but I do have another part that's not on this vessel because I was tight for part count um, that will help me with the staging too, and we'll get to that in a future episode. Anyway, we're getting close to the SRV separation. There we go. And there are no parachutes on those things, so they're just going to crash into the water. Uh, they're not going to crash onto KSP because I'm already uh, tilted over enough. A little bit of a wobble, but that's not a problem. You might also notice that there's just a single stage. I didn't build a little orbiter, and the reason why I didn't do that is because I didn't want to use that LV-909 engine. Another look at the interior, seeing that raster prop monitor is still not working. Working on that, hopefully that will be working soon. Uh, yeah, I didn't use the LV-909 because that is an experimental part that I've yet to really unlock. And again, it's from a contract that disappeared, so in an effort not to really cheat, I'm going to uh, not use it. And the thing to notice along this ascent is how well it tracks along the prograde vector. This is what I would love to be able to do if I simply had the manual dexterity to do it. So uh, this is what I would consider um, uh, an ideal launch profile. Anyway, what this is going to do is just burn until my apoapsis gets up to 80 kilometers and then it shuts off the engine. That's all it does. I do the final circularization manually. Uh, I played around with getting KOS to do it for me, but I could never write a script that could do it as well as I could do it by hand. And I'm a bit fastidious once I get into better control systems of my uh, of doing my orbit. So, returning control to manual. There we go. The program has now ended. We can now close that window. And we'll just cut straight to our circularization burn. Now the plan here is not just to circularize. Again, I want to get my velocity up to 2,500 meters per second. So I'm going to keep burning past uh, the required orbital velocity. But as I do that, I want you to take a look at the periapsis. And once periapsis passes 70, I'm in an orbit. And at that moment, um, I had about 642 meters per second left in my uh, in the vessel, which meant that this ascent cost me 3,625 meters per second. That's uh, I think that's pretty awesome. Anyway, 
Uh, let's see, I've just passed 2,500 meters per second and the contract hasn't gone green. Maybe it is the surface velocity I need. So I'll also keep burning and budget for this. But, oh well. Okay, burn. And there we go, 2,500 meters per second. Okay, now both surface and orbital velocity is over 2,500 meters per second. There's no other details here, so that's confusing. Okay. Okay, either there's something wrong or there's a parameter here I'm not aware of. Maybe, maybe it expects you to be in the atmosphere. Maybe it does. You know what? I'm going to change my mission plan then. I think Jeb does have enough electricity to do an orbit. So what I'm going to do for my actual mission, remember this is just a simulation, is I think what I'll let him do is do an orbit and then I'll bring my periapsis down into the atmosphere. And when I return around, I will be doing more than 2,500 meters per second entering into the atmosphere. That heat shield should be fine for that. I'm not dropping from that high, just from about 600 kilometers. Here you can see my orbit that I got. What is that orbit by? Oh, okay, let's try a thousand kilometers. There is so much for my calculation. What is my orbital period now? Was it anywhere near my, my orbital period? It says, where is it? It's not here. Okay, it still says I have two hours and 20 minutes of electricity. So if I turn the SAS off, I should be fine. And I, oh, well, time to periapsis is a little over an hour, so that's pretty close to my orbital period. I have two hours and 20 minutes of electricity left, even with the SAS turned off. Should be good, should be good. So I'm going to go around, enter back into the atmosphere at over 2,500 meters per second when I do this for real, and uh, hopefully I can beat this, this speed record that way. We'll see how it goes. But that's going to have to be for a future episode. So thank you for watching. And I hope to see you next time.